السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. صلى الله سيدنا ومولانا محمد النبي الأمي وعلى. Today we're talking about a very unique Sahabi. Very, very different from the rest of the Sahaba. Very different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him in many, many different ways. And we had so much information on him in the narrations that I didn't know how much to take. There was just so much stuff about him in the hadith that I had to be very selective about what I wanted to take. And every single point about him was so interesting that I thought, okay, this will be interesting, I'll take this. Then I'd find another thing at the, and I'd find, okay, this would be very interesting too. And then it turned out that it would be so much that I have to leave some of the things out. This is Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. His actual name is Tamim ibn Aws al-Dari. The name of his clan was Banu Adar, which was a clan of the tribe of Banu Judam. Banu Judam was located on the Red Sea up in the northwest area next to the border of the Byzantine Empire in Sham. And all the tribes that were located in those areas by the borders of the Byzantine Empire, they were all Christian tribes. So Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala who also was a Christian. If you look in your maps at the back, you will see Banu Judham, J-U-D-H-A-M at the top left hand corner. Just a brief overview of his life. He accepted Islam, of course. Then he settled down in Medina during the lifetime of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam passed away, he remained in Medina during the Khilafah of Bakr Siddiq, during the Khilafah of Amir al Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then after the assassination of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu, like many other Sahaba who were very disheartened with the state of the affairs of the Ummah at that time because of the assassination of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, many of them left the city of Medina Munawwara. Tamim al-Dari was one of the Sahaba who also left. And he settled down in Palestine in an area that was given to him by the Blessed Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Inshallah, we'll talk about that later. There's many things about Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. There's very few people who had status in the eyes of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab because you had to really prove yourself in front of him in order for you to get his respect. So there's very few people who Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu would show respect towards. But Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu was one of them. Another very famous one amongst the younger Sahaba was Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. He used to sit in the council of people whom uh, Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab used to consult with in important matters. Also Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the jurist who's going to be the last in our shining stars list inshallah. We're going to talk about him at the end. He was also well respected by Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab. But regarding Tamim al-Dari, Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab used to call him Min khayri ahl Madina, the best people from the people of Medina Munawwara. He was from the best people of the city of Medina Munawwara. He accepted Islam in the ninth year of Hijrah. This is very important to remember. In the ninth year of Hijrah. So we read yesterday about Jarid ibn Abdullah that he accepted Islam six months before Rasulullah passed away. He accepted Islam one year and some months before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away. So he was, <clears throat> he also did not get to spend a lot of time. If you really compare the time he spent with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi to many other sahaba like the Khulafai Rashidin who spent 23 years like Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar Farooq, Uthman ibn Affan, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Abdullah ibn Umar Maktoum and many other sahaba and even Sa'ad bin Mu'ad who spent at least 8-9 years. He spent very little time with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When <clears throat> Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu came into the masjid one day during his khilafah and he saw people were praying taraweeh in separate groups. Not like how we have it today, you go into the masjid that in the month of Ramadan and you see one big congregation praying taraweeh behind one imam. In his time and in the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq before him, there were small congregations. 
and everybody was praying their own taraweeh behind their own imam. Sometimes there'd be a big group, sometimes there'd be a small group, sometimes three, four people, sometimes larger. So Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala, who didn't like this too much, he decided to congregate everybody under one imam. So this idea or this uh, sunnah of following one, having one congregation in one masjid behind one imam was started by Amir al-Mu'mineen radiallahu ta'ala and we see this sunnah being followed to this day for 1400 years. Amir al-Mu'mineen radiallahu ta'ala who chose Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala who to lead the men in the taraweeh so everyone would pray behind him amongst the men and for the woman he chose Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu to lead the salah which tells us that Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu was also a hafiz of Quran al-Hakim he was a hafiz of Quran al-Hakim so he was the, he would lead the woman in the uh, taraweeh while Ubay ibn Ka'ab radiallahu ta'ala anhu would lead the men <coughs> During the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu's khilafah, the way that Juma was held was that everybody would pray their sunnahs, then the imam would come, that would be, for example, uh, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he would deliver the sermon, and then uh, everybody would pray their salah. So there was no talk that would take place between the actual khutbah, the Arabic khutbah, and the sunnah salat. So, once Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala who came to Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, if you allow me, I can narrate a hadith and stories, and he knew a lot of stories, because when you read his life, you'll see a lot of stories coming up. And I would like to narrate stories that would uh, bring people closer to Islam and uh, encourage them to practice the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala who refused first time. A little while later, Tamim al-Dari came again and he said, if you allow me, before you come out to deliver your Jummah sermon, the khutbah, I would like to deliver a talk and I can give people uh, encouragement by telling them stories, true stories, and a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Amir al-Mu'minin radiallahu ta'ala anhu was not so enthused about it. He said, "Let's forget it." Third time, a while later, he came again, and Amir al-Mu'minin this time allowed him. So before Hadha Umar ibn Khattab would come out to deliver the Juma khutbah sermon, the adhan was called before that. Then he would come and deliver the Juma khutbah. Before that, Hadat Tamim al-Dari would come and he would stand and deliver a talk to the people. The talk that I deliver here in this masjid before the Juma khutbah and in every masjid nowadays, in every masjid all across the world, there's a talk delivered between the, before the Juma khutbah. That is a sunnah that is started by Abba Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala. So this is started his practice that was started under the permission of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala So we could say this is another sunnah that was started by actually Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala And this was started because they saw the condition of the ummah was not the same as it was in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The iman was weaker and people's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not the same. Whatever they saw, they noticed things. So therefore he allowed the Mimudari radiallahu to start delivering the talks before the sermon. So it's mentioned in the hadith لم يكن يقص على أحد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا أبي بكر ولا عمر that no one would tell, give a talk or tell stories during the time of رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم before the Juma sermon, nor in the time of Bakr, nor in the time of Umar. وكان أول من قص تميم الداري and the first one to start these talks before the Juma sermon was هذا تميم الداري استأذن عمر he took permission from عمر بن الخطاب فأذن له فقص قائما he gave him permission and he would give a talk standing up. Also, it's known about تميم الداري رضي الله تعالى عنه that he was very, very, um, very perpetual about his تهجد. And it was known about two Sahaba. It's known about two Sahaba. 
that they would recite the whole Quran in one rakah. Tamimu Dari radiallahu anhu was one, to sah- one of the Sahaba and the other was Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. These two Sahaba, it's well known about them that they would recite the whole Quran in tahajjud in one whole rakah. Just in one rakah. And this is also known about Imam Abu Hanifa rahimullah as well. Amongst the tabi'een. Once it's mentioned by one of the tabi'een that I went into masjid and I saw Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu praying tahajjud and he was reciting the ayah Am hasib al-ladheena jtarah sayyat an naj'alahum kal-ladheena aman wa amlu salihat sawa'am mahyam wa matum sa'a ma yahkumun He was reciting this ayah over and over and over again throughout the whole night until right before suhoor. He just recited this one ayah. He was in a certain spiritual state that affected him in such a way that he just had to recite this ayah throughout the whole night. So he was swooned by this ayah. And he recited it the whole night. It's also mentioned about this Sahabi, Hadat Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that when he came to accept Islam from his area, he brought with him many, he brought with him many lanterns and oil, olive oil, to light those lanterns. So when he accepted Islam, it happened, the, happened to be the day of Jummah. Actually it was a Thursday and it was the night of Jummah. So that night, he took his slave, Abu al-Murad, with him. And they went to the masjid and he told him, I want you to hang up these lanterns throughout the whole masjid and put oil in them and light the masjid. This was the first time in the history of Islam that the masjid was ever lighted. So it's known about Tamim al-Dari that he was the first one, Asraja al-Masajid. He is the, one, the first one in Islam to ever light the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And he is the one who started the sunnah of lighting the masajid. Before this, up to the ninth year of Hijrah, when darkness came, it was dark in the masjid. So he came to the masjid at the night of Jummah, him and his slave, and they hung up the lanterns throughout the whole masjid, lit them with the olive oil. And when Rasulullah came in the masjid at night, he was amazed that the whole masjid is illuminated. He said, Man fa'ala hadha? Who did this? So they said, Tamim. So Rasulullah sallallahu said, Nawwarta al-Islam. You illuminated Islam. Nawwar Allahu alayka fi dunya wal akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make a light upon you in the dunya and in the akhirah. This was a dua that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made for Tamim al-Dari. And then he's, that's, that dua should be enough to make him happy. But then he said one other thing that would make all of us happy too. He said, Ama inni law kanat li ibnatan la zawaj tukaha. If I had a daughter, I would marry her to you, Tamim. I would marry her to you. So there was a Sahabi who was sitting there. His name was Abu Musa. This is not Abu Musa Sharira. Then there's another Sahabi. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have a daughter. Her name is Ummul Mughira. She's available. Take her as your daughter. If you want, I can get her married to her. So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that marry her to him right now. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so happy. He said marry to him right now. And through Ummul Mughira radiallahu ta'ala anha, 
They had a daughter by the name of Ruqiya that was the only child that Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu ever had. He had never had any sons nor any other daughter besides Ruqiya rahimahullah. And that's why his agnomen is Abu Ruqiya. He's not known by his agnomen, but his agnomen, his kunya was Abu Ruqiya. So this is the incident of him lighting up the masjid and how he got married as well. I told you that all of us would be very happy when we hear this part. Another very amazing thing about Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu is that he accepted Islam through a jinn. It's mentioned in the narrations that he was on his way somewhere in the desert, night came upon him and he came into a valley and he was about to go to sleep, he made his place where he was going to sleep and he heard something cry out, Udh Billah, fear Allah. Somebody said to him, fear Allah. فَإِنَّ الْجِنَّ لَا تُجِيرُ أَحَدًا عَلَى اللَّهِ The jinnat cannot save anyone from Allah. You see, the Arabs used to believe that jinnat were like gods. Many of them used to worship them as gods. So this jinn is saying, إِنَّ الْجِنَّ لَا تُجِيرُ أَحَدًا عَلَى اللَّهِ The jinnat cannot save you. From anyone from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, we're not God, so don't worship us. I said, who are you speaking? Why are you saying this? He said, خَرَجَ رَسُولُ الْأُمِّيِّينَ The Rasul of the unlettered has come out. The Rasul of the unlettered. Rasulullah sallallahu was often referred to as the Rasul of the unlettered. Our ummah is called the unlettered ummah. And inshallah, before the end of this, if I do not forget, remind me, I will tell you why our ummah is called the unlettered ummah. There is a very strong reason behind this, which inshallah will also enlighten us to other very important points that are important for us to know. So he said that the prophet of the unlettered ummah has come out. And we just prayed salah behind him. We have just prayed salah behind him. And we accepted Islam. We pledged with him. And we follow him now. And the jinnat's power is now gone. Remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in the Quran Hakim about how the jinnat would go up to the skies. And when information was given from the seven heavens, was brought down to the angels the jinnat would go into these gatherings of the angels to hear some of what was being told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the angels. And they would steal that information and bring it down and would give that information to the kahins, the fortune tellers. So these jinnat are saying to Tamim al-Dari that, that their ability to do that is now gone. They cannot go and steal this information from the angels now, وَرُمِيَتْ بِالشُّهُبْ Because the flames of fire are thrown upon them. Go to Muhammad. فَانْطَلِقْ إِلَى Muhammad فَأَسْلِمْ Go to Muhammad and accept Islam. He said, I was very confused. The Mimudari mentions that I was very confused. And he was a Christian. And Christians had a lot of respect. For those amongst them who used to live in the wilderness, the monks. And there was one monk amongst them, his name was Ayyub, who had his own monastery in the wilderness. He said, I went to Ayyub. And I said to him, this is what I've heard, this is what happened to me. Tell me, is what he is saying is true? He said, Sadaqu, they have spoken the truth. You will find that he is coming out from the haram, the blessed land. وَمُهَاجِرَةَ الْحَرَمِ And he is migrating towards the haram. In other words, Makkah Mukarramah and Medina Munawwara. 
وَهُوَ خَيْرُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ And of the, all the prophets, he's the best of all prophets. فَلَا تُسْبَقْ إِلَيْهِ Nobody should beat you to him. Get there as soon as possible and accept Islam. So this is how Tamim Muddari رضي الله تعالى عنه came towards Islam. But there is also mentioned another incident about his acceptance to Islam. We can combine both of these stories or both of these reasons as to how he accepted Islam in our own way. That this was one of the causes and that was also another cause. Tamim al-Dari is the only Sahabi on the face of this earth ever to see Dajjal. The only person, I'm not talking about Sahaba, the only person on the face of this earth to ever meet Dajjal. His story is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari in many of the hadith books. I'm going to narrate that hadith to you right now inshallah. When he came in the ninth year of Hijrah, as we mentioned, one of the reasons why I accepted Islam was because of him going to the monk and then the jinnat he heard. And another reason was he saw the Dajjal and he wanted to narrate the whole incident of his experience and his encounter with the Dajjal to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's when he came in the ninth year of the Hijjah. Now, this, this tells us that the likelihood of his meeting with Dajjal was just before the ninth year of Hijrah, maybe the seventh or the eighth. Now the seventh or eighth year of Hijrah means that by that time when Tamim al-Dari came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had already taken over most of the Arabian Peninsula. That is, most of the Arabs had already accepted Islam. The battle of Uhud had already taken place. The battle of Badr had already taken place. The battle of the trench had already taken place. The conquest of Mecca had already taken place. Now, as you listen to this narration, you'll understand this whole incident much better, inshallah. He's coming in the ninth year of Hijrah and he's explaining this whole incident to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu was so happy because he had already told the Sahaba Ridwan Ali Majmain about the coming of Dajjal and explained all the things that the Mimu Dari Ridwan had uh, mentioned to him during his encounter with Dajjal. That he wanted the Mimu Dari to narrate the same thing on the pulpit in Masjid Nabwi to the Sahaba Ridwan Ali Majmain again. Just as a confirmation of what he had already told the Sahaba Ridwan Ali Majmain. So Fatima bint Qais radiallahu ta'ala anha is the narrator of this hadith. She says, I was sitting in my home and I had just fulfilled my idda, my period of time after my husband had been martyred in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I heard someone call out from the Masjid al-Nabwi, As-Salatu Jami'ah, As-Salatu Jami'ah. So we all came running to the Masjid, the women, the men, and soon enough, the whole masjid was full, the woman in the back, the men in the front. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was standing in the front and Tamim al-Dari radiallahu anhu was standing right next to him. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had a big smile on his face. He had a big smile on his face. And he said to people, Everyone sit in their place. Everyone sit in your place. And he says, Do you know why I have gathered all of you? Said Allah wa Rasulu alam ya Rasulullah, you know better. He said, Inni wallahi ma jama'atukum li rahbatin wa la li rahbatin. I have not gathered you to encourage you towards some good deed or warn you against some evil. No, no. Walakin jama'atukum, I have gathered you because this is Tamim al-Dari and he's a Christian man. He's a Christian. And he just came and accepted Islam and has pledged on my hands. And he told me something that I have been telling you much before and repeatedly have told you throughout these years about the Antichrist. But I want you to hear it from his own tongue. And then Rasulullah sat down amongst the Sahaba, Tamim al-Dari came up and he narrated the whole incident. He says, 
I went with a group of 50 people from my tribe of Banu Jadam in a Safinat and Bahariya in a big ship. A storm came and our ship was swept away and we had no idea where we were. This continued for one month that our ship was just going all over the place. And we were just not navigating towards any particular place. We had no control over anything. Finally, we saw land. It was sunset, time of Maghrib. We came on one of our smaller ships, like a small boat. We took the boat and we arrived on this land. And what we see in front of us is this animal, like an animal, which had so much hair that we could not tell the front from the back. Which part is the front and which part is the back. So we came up to it and we said, what are you? Mahanti, what are you? He said, Anal Jassasa. My name is Jassasa. So what do you mean Jassasa? What does Jassasa mean? She said, don't ask me any more questions. There's a man in this building, in this monastery. The word used is Deir. Deir means like a monastery. An old building that's abandoned and isolated. There's a man in this. And go to him. He will tell you all the news of the things that you want to know. He said that before we left, she gave the names of one of the people amongst us. He, spec he said, she said, this is your name. When she said the name of one of the people amongst us in our tribe, we said, this is shaitan. How does she, she know the name? So we ran, we ran towards this building. We entered inside this built building, which had a lot of vaults. And we finally entered. And we see this man who's tied up with his hands and his feet. His hands are tied up, shackled up to his neck. And from his knees down to his ankles, he's thoroughly shackled and fettered to the wall. I just want you to note one thing. He says, Aadamu insan. They mentioned that he's a human being. The word uses insan. He's a human being. There's one thing we need to remember about Dajjal, that he is not a creature or something from another land or another world. He's a human being. So he looks just like you and me. And that is exactly how Rasulullah has described him in the ahadith. Anyhow, we saw him as a very big man. And he was well shackled against the wall. We said to him, who are you? He said, you already see my condition. You know about me, whatever you need to know. Tell me about yourself. Who are you? They said we are from the Arab and we were on a ship and the storm came upon us. We've been just going in the ship for one month and we just arrived here. He said, tell me some things about yourself. They said, what do you want to know? He said, tell me about Nakhle Baysan. Baysan is a land in Jordan. It's one of the most verdant lands in all of Jordan, even today. So he's asking about this piece of land, which is full of greenery in Jordan. And if you look it up in the map, Baysan still exists on the map. Not in this map, if you look it up on a map. He says, what do you want to ask about Baysan? He said, I want to ask you about the date palm trees, the groves there. Is it producing fruit? They said, yes, it's producing fruit. He said, a time will come when, it'll, when it will stop for do, producing fruit. You will, it will not produce any more date, dates. 
He said, tell me about Buhayrat al-Tabariyah. The Tiberius, this is a sea in modern day Israel. It's right by the border of Lebanon and Israel. The Tiberius, also called Tabariyah in Arabic. Tell me about this Tabariyah, the Buhayrat al-Tabariyah. Tell me something about it. Is there any water in it? They said, of course, it has a lot of water. He says, a time will come when its water will disappear. I was just reading a few months ago that they've mentioned about the, the sea, the Tiberius. It's also called the Sea of Galileo. That its water is decreasing one foot every single year. So the scientists are very worried about this. But this is being predicted already in this hadith. Then he asked about a place called Zuhar. They said, what do you want to know about Zuhar? He said, is the water of Zuhar have a lot of water? And is that water cultivating the land? They said, yes. It has a lot of water and it's cultivating the land and producing a lot of cultivation and crops. He said, tell me about the Nabi al ummiyin Tell me about the Nabi of the unlettered. See, he says the same thing that the Jinnat said previously. The Rasul of the Ummiyin. What does this mean? What it means very simply is that we are Ummah that don't go by calculations. We look at the moon, we look at the sun, and we note down what time we have to pray our salah, and what time we're going to start our Ramadan, end our Ramadan, what time the Hijjah is going to start, what day the Hijjah, the tenth of the Hijjah is going to be. We don't go by calculations. We follow the moon and the star. We look at that and we know. We don't use any instruments of any special type. We are the unlettered ummah. This is what he's referring to. So this concept of fallen calculations is against this name that has been given to us and this laqab that has been given to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam of being the Rasul of the unlettered people. Any human being, any Muslim can go out and find out when the month of Ramadan is going to begin and when the month of Ramadan is going to end. This is not a special thing that is only in the hands of a few people that they have those type of instruments that only they can tell, okay, now the month of Ramadan begins. Now the month of Ramadan ends. No, this is something that it could be a Bedouin, it could be an educated person. Any single person should be able to tell when the month of Ramadan begins. You just have to look at the moon. When you sight it, you know that Ramadan has begun. The Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is such that everyone is equal. It's not that because one has education, he reaches a higher level than the rest. No. This is the meaning of unlettered. And we really are going against this name that has been given to us. Rasulullah has used this name for his ummah as well. He says about himself, I am the ummi of the ummiyin. I am the nabi, I am the ummi nabi of the ummiyin ummah. Anyhow. So Dajjal asked him about nabi al ummiyin. What has he done? Has he left Makkah? Has he arrived in Yathrib? Has the migration took in, taken place? And have the Arabs fought with him? Now this is the ninth year of, when is this? Eighth year of Hijrah. All that has already happened. We said yes. All that has happened. And, أَنَّهُ قَدْ ظَهَرَ عَلَى مَنْ يَلِيهِ مِنَ الْعَرَبُ وَطَاعُهُ He has taken over most of Arab and they have followed him. He said, is that true? Really? He's surprised. Really? We said yes. He said, "Ama inna daga khayr allahum an yutiyhu." It's better for them if they follow him, because he is a true Rasul of Allah. Who is where bearing witness? The Jal. Remember, when he comes, he won't say that, but he's saying that at this occasion. 
When he comes in this world, he's only going to spread fitna. But right now, he's telling the truth. أَمَا إِنَّ ذَاكَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ أَنْ يُطِيعُوا It's better for them that they follow him. وَإِنِّي مُخْبِرُكُمْ عَنِّي And now I will tell you about myself. إِنِّي أَنَا الْمَسِيحِ I am the anointed one. These are term. The word Masih is a term that's used both for Isa alayhi salatu wasalam and for Dajjal. We say Masih ibn Maryam and we also say Masih had Dajjal because both of them are anointed. And it will be Isa ibn Maryam who will kill Masih had Dajjal. Masih ibn Maryam is anointed with goodness and Masih al-Dajjal is anointed with evil. And so the leader of the good will destroy the leader of the evil. He will be the king of all the evil people, just as Masih ibn Maryam will be the king of all the good people in that time. A time will come when I will come out and I will travel the earth for 40 days. And there will not be a single city, but I will land in that city. City. He will only go to cities. He doesn't need to go to every single village and every single town. He will just land in the cities because in his, when he will arrive at that time, most of the people of the world will be living in cities. Yes. This is a change, a demographic change that has, uh, that has occurred first time in the history of mankind. And I was reading it in National Geographic. There was an article that came about it about 10 years ago where they mentioned that this is the first time in the history of mankind that people are gravitating towards the cities to the extent that now there are more people in cities than there are in the villages. Whereas historically, it always was that, that there was more people in the villages and in the countryside than there were in the cities. If you look at, at Makkah Mukarramah in the time of Rasulullah and Medina Munawwara as an example, how many people were there in Makkah Mukarramah and how many people were there in Medina Munawwara? And compare that to the level or the number of people that were living outside, the Bedouins that were living outside. All these different Sahaba we talk about, they're all living in the countryside. Now look at Saudi Arabia today, and most of Arabia is living in Riyadh, in Mecca, in Medina, in Jeddah. Yes. People have left the tribes. I asked the driver, he was Qurayshi. I said, your tribe, Quraysh tribe, where is it now? He said, oh, we're all over the place. Somebody's in Jeddah, somebody's in Taif, somebody's in Riyadh. That's where all the jobs are. So that's where they go. Everybody wants to live the fast life, so everybody's coming towards the cities. So he will go to the cities. And he will be here for 40 days in this world. And he will enter every single city except two cities. Number one, Makkah Mukarramah. And number two, at tayyibah He called it Tayyibah, the pure city. I will not enter Makkah and I cannot enter enter at tayyibah the pure city. Those two places have been made haram upon me. When I will try to enter them, there will be an angel standing with an unsheathed sword at every gate of Makkah Mukarramah, at every gate that leads into Makkah Mukarramah and Medina Munawwara. And they will stop me from entering into Makkah Mukarramah and Medina Munawwara. It's mentioned one hadith that he will stand in a place outside of Medina Munawwara called Jaraf. Juraf, I'm sorry. Juraf. The King Fahad Hospital in Medina Munawwara is in Juraf, right next to Juraf. And he will stand there and from there on the mountain he will look out and he will show the minarets of Masjid al Nabawi to his followers and he says that these white minarets of this masjid are the minarets of the masjid of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But I cannot go there, and neither can you. And that's when Medina Munawwara will convulse 
because of an earthquake three times. He will hit his scepter against the ground. Medina Munawwara will shake once. He will hit it again. It will shake again second time. He will hit it again. It will shake the third time. And all the munafiqeen, the hypocrites in Medina Munawwara will leave the city and Medina will become what it was always called Tayyiba, the pure city. The pure city. This is the name of Medina Munawwara. Taba Tayyiba. That's why when we ever say Medina, we either call it Medina Munawwara, the enlightened city, or we call it At Tayyiba or At Taba. He said after Tamim al Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Fatima bint Qais radiallahu narrates that after Tamim al Dari narrated this whole thing, Rasulullah had a little stick in his hand, he hit it on the pulpit three times, and he said, Hadihi tayyiba, hadihi tayyiba, hadihi tayyiba, this is tayyiba. And then he said, Hala ala hal kuntu ahadithukum dharik. Did I not always tell you about this? That the jal cannot enter tayyiba. The jal cannot enter tayyiba. And the people said, Yes, Ya Rasulullah, you did tell us. He said, the story of Tamim made me very happy. And it is according to everything that I have already told you except for one thing. What is that one thing? He said, although Tamim Uddari did not clearly mention it, but since his tribe was located on the Red Sea, so you would assume that wherever his, wherever his uh, ship had arrived, on that land or that island where he saw Masih al-Dajjal that must have been either in the Gulf down in Yemen, below Yemen or in the Red Sea so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said illa anna fi bahr al-Sham aw fi bahr al-Yemen la this jazeera is not in the Red Sea nor is it in the Gulf bal min qibl al-Mashriq it's towards the east it's towards the east. Rasulullah often mentioned when he talked about fitan, he would say they will come from the east. There's one hadith, I always narrate this. Once a group of people from Yemen came to Rasulullah I'll say this because we should speak the truth. A group of people from Yemen came to Rasulullah and Rasulullah made dua for them. There was a people from Najd, the eastern provinces of Saudi Arabia. And they said to Rasulullah ﷺ, make dua for us too, Ya Rasulullah. And Rasulullah ﷺ stayed quiet. Then he made dua again for the people of Yemen. The people of Najd said, Ya Rasulullah, make dua for us too. The third time, Rasulullah ﷺ made dua for the people of Yemen. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, please make dua for us too. Rasulullah ﷺ said, Al-Fitna min al-Mashriq. Fitan will arrive from your area, from Najd. Right now, the control of uh, Saudi Arabia is in the hands of the people of Najd. This version or this specific type of Islam that they're promoting all around the world, this is that what Rasulullah was referring to when he said, Al Fitna min al Mashriq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us against it. And one of the main symptoms of this fitna is, is that those who fall into it, they lose one very important thing. And that is adab. They lose adab. They lose adab. They lose their love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They lose their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And their salawat and their ibadat are just like a external action which has no spirit inside of it. It lacks spirituality because they have no adab. It has been taken away from them. This is the main sign of this fitna. People put their Qur'ans on the floor and people make accusations about doing dhikr as bid'ah. This is all part of this fitna. All part of the same fitna. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us against it. And of course, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after he said this, وَأَوْمَا بِيَدْهِ لَلْمَشْرِكِ He pointed towards the mushrik. That no, 
He comes from the mashriq. He comes from the mashriq. In other words, where you saw the jal, that was not the Gulf Sea and it wasn't the Red Sea. It was that side. It was on that side. All the fitan are there and the jal is also there. We were talking about Tamim Uddari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. There's a lot of things about him. I'm just going to mention one or two other things inshallah and then we will end this inshallah. As I mentioned, he was called Khair min Khairi Ahl al Medina. Min Khairi Ahl al Medina. The best of people from Medina Munawwara. It's a narration by Muawiyah ibn Harmal. He's a tabi'i from the time of Amir al Mu'minin Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He narrates that once I came to Medina Munawwara and I was staying in the masjid for three days, I had nothing to eat. I came to Amur, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umar ibn Khattab, I said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, I do tawbah in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in front of you, I want you to bear witness, after this I'm going to be dead, I have nothing to eat. So, Amir al-Mu'mineen asked him, who are you? He said, my name is Muawiyah. He said, go to Tamim al-Dari, go to Tamim al-Dari. He said, that it was a habit of Tamim al-Dari, that when he was praying his salah, with the congregation. As soon as he finished his salah, he would hit the person on his right side and the person on his left side. And he'd say, come with me. We're going to go and eat together. This was his habit. Every single salah. He would always invite guests. One, the one who would sit on his right and the one who was sitting on his left. So if anybody wanted to have a meal, they would sit on Tamim Dari's right or his left. This is what Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab was telling Muawiyah, go sit next to him in salah. So he prayed salah right next to Tamim al-Dari. After the salah was finished, he hit him on his thigh. And he hit the person on the other side of his thigh. He said, let's go, time to eat. He said that we went and I ate and I ate so much because for three days I had not eaten anything. So I ate and ate and ate and I kept on eating. And then Umar ibn Khattab came to the door of Tamim al-Dari in a rush. He said, Tamim, come out. He said, what happened? He said, there's a fire in Medina Munawwara. There's a fire in Medina Munawwara. So he said, Tamim al-Dari knew exactly what Amir al-Mu'mineen intended. He said, man ana wa ma ana, who am I and what am I? Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, don't tell me to do this. Who am I? I'm nothing. I'm nothing. You're telling me to come and take this fire out? No. He said, no, you must come out. So, the Mimudari came out and Muawiyah, the narrator, says, I walked behind him and Amir al-Mu'mineen towards this fire and we see there's this big fire that has already taken over many homes. Tamim al-Dari took off his shawl and he started blowing it towards the fire and the fire started moving away as if it was scared of Tamim al-Dari And he kept on getting closer and shooing it away with his shawl and the fire started moving further and further away until he took the fire all the way to a valley outside of Medina Munawwara. And then he came back and he said, Muawiyah radiallahu anhu says, Rahimahullah says, the Umar radiallahu anhu was watching this whole thing and he said, Laysa man ra'a kamal lam yara. Seeing is believing. Those who have never seen this, what the Dari just did, will never believe this if they were told that he did this. This was his Karama of Tamim al-Dari. And of course, it's not far-fetched for somebody like Tamim al-Dari, considering he accepted Islam at the hands of a jinn, and then he saw the Dajjal, and all these amazing things that we are hearing about him, it's not far-fetched to hear that he would be able to do such a thing as well. He did many karamat, and he was known for that, and that's why Amir al-Mu'mineen brought him out, but he wanted to hide himself. 
He didn't want to bring himself out in front of the people. This is the way of our Sufiya and our elders that sometimes they can do, they have kashf or sometimes they can produce certain karamat but they don't like to show it to people. They don't like to show it to people. This is Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala he's saying that Ya, ya Amin al-Mu'mineen, don't let me bring this out. I don't want to show myself. I'm nothing. I mean, they're such great people, but they're so effaced. They faced themselves, completely annihilated their self, that they thought nothing of themselves. Imagine if we were given one of these powers, you know, we try to take over the whole world. The whole world is now mine, and try to take over the hearts of people, and you know, we have people following us, and subhanAllah. They thought nothing of themselves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the humility of the Sahaba Ridwan Allah These are just some of the stories about Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, which tells us, as I was mentioned in the beginning, that he was a very unique Sahabi. Very unique Sahabi. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Okay, so there's mention about attractive land as well. There's a lot of brothers and sisters online who are asking me questions about the crew members who are on the ship with him. I wasn't there with them, so I really don't know. Of course, and there's not, it's not necessary for us to know such things anyways. This is just extra details. The main thing is to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to bring to light the existence of Masih al-Dajjal. And I'm sure many people are asking, okay, that means he's already alive. If he's already alive, then where is he? Especially when there are also a hadith that say just the other way, that he's going to be born in a family of Jews, and his mother will look like this, his father will look like this. So if he's going to be born, and yet he's already there, then how do you reconcile these ahadith? I remember one thing that Mu'abrahim mentioned in the conference that they held over there about the signs before the Day of Judgment, is that if you really look at all the ahadith about the Jal, you realize that it's really confusing. It's really confusing. And it's a mystery, and it's meant to be a mystery. Just like the night of Qadr is meant to be a mystery. You'll never know which night it is. Likewise, you'll really never know about Masih Dajjal. It's a mystery, but it's oh, the point of that mystery, and the point of keeping a mystery, is to keep us in suspense and make preparation for the coming of Dajjal, to know that he is, and he will come, and to make proper preparation for him. Inshallah, whenever we have a seminar about the signs of the Day of Judgment, we can talk more about that in detail, inshallah. So it's just a mystery, really. This uh, story of Masih al-Dajjal. And that's why when I looked upon all the hadith on the subject, I really was confused. I was very confused. And I, as much as I tried my best to reconcile, I could not reconcile those hadith. So that means really that it's best kept a mystery. Even when we look at the muhaddithin, they have not reconciled the hadith, they have kept them as is. They have kept them as is. Right? They haven't mentioned anything about uh, how to gather these hadith in such a way that they can add up to one logical meaning. Right? So it's best we just leave it at that. Huh? <laughs> But there is one thing the brothers are saying that I left out that's mentioned in the book about the tract of land. Jazakallah okay. khair, I will mention that very quickly. When Tamim al-Dari radiallahu ta'ala who came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a piece of land for himself and his tribe. He said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I know a time will come that Allah will give you will give you uh, power 
and reign over all the lands, including the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire. Even though it may not be in your lifetime. So, Ya Rasulullah, Hibli Qariyati min Bayt al Laham, please give me a portion of land from Bayt al Laham. So, Rasulullah was very happy and he did give a large tract of land from this area which he asked for. It's mentioned in the hadith that area is called the Ainun and it exists in Palestine. Apparently, it's still known by that name. He said, I give you the mountains and the flatlands and its water and its cultivating uh, and its verdant uh, greenery and its vineyards and its flowers and its fruits. Everything of that is yours and for your children. And for your children and for the children after them all the way until the day of judgment. And if anyone tries to usurp your land or try to take over it, may the curse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon them. That portion of land is now in Israel. It's called Ainun. And this portion, this part called Bayt al Laham, is actually that part of land where Isa alayhi salatu was salam was born. Remember, the Mimudari was a Christian, so he knew about the importance and the sacredness and the holiness of this land. So he wanted that for himself and his tribe. So he asked for this piece of land. I don't know if it was for that reason, but for sure he knew because he is um, being a Christian beforehand about this land and the sacredness of this land. So he asked from it, for it from Rasulullah Wasallam, and Rasulullah gave that to him. So it's mentioned that Bayt al Laham al Qariyatul Lati Wulida Isa ibn Maryam Fiyah. Bayt al Laham is that piece of land where Isa alayhi salatu salam was born, which is nowadays called Bethlehem. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam wrote this on a piece of paper, on a piece of parchment for him, many of the great Sahaba were sitting there and were bearing witness to it. Amir al Mu'minin Umar ibn Khattab was there, Abu Bakr Siddiq was there, Uthman ibn Affan was there, and other great Sahaba were there. After Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi passed away, after Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu passed away, during the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he asked Amir al-Mu'mineen if he could give that piece of land to him and he pre presented that parchment to him. So Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab said, Ana shahid al I was bear witness because I was there at that time when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi wrote that for you. So he gave that to him, but he did not leave to go there and tell the assassination of Uthman ibn Affan. Then he went and he settled there and he passed away there in that part of uh, Palestine. So, now, why is this a miracle? Was because during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi this area of land was all controlled by the Byzantine Empire. And yet Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi was allotting it to him that this is yours, meaning that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi was aware that this land will one day be under the hands of the Muslims. سبحان ربك رب العزة يا ما يصفون وسلام المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاك الله خير